thanks. Uh, thanks, Remy, for, for having me along. Uh, this, this talk definitely came out of a rant. Um, so uh, I feel like uh, thinking about passwords on an ongoing basis is my penance uh, for, for starting the OAuth thing that happened. So I'm sorry for that. Uh, <laughs> I hope that this, uh, this talk makes it a little bit better. Um, I'm not sure if we've got... Oh, my, la my laptop is off because it's been sitting here for so long. That's what, I'm just going to enter my password. <laughs> no. So, um, so earlier this year, uh, I haven't, I, I work at Condé Nast these days. Um, I don't think about passwords in my day job, um, thankfully. Uh, but earlier this year, I was um, in a totally amazing place. Uh, oops. A totally amazing place uh, called Wadi Rum, uh, which is in Jordan, and uh, you've probably seen it in various films. I think The Martian was filmed there, and uh, Star Wars, the most recent one, had some scenes filmed there. It's incredible. Um, so, uh, so I was I was hanging out here. Uh, we went on uh, a, a tour with with some nomads um, out into the desert. So this was. The, the nomad in question, um, so he's a Bedouin uh, guy named Salim. And so he took us out into the desert and, uh, and just showed us around this, this amazing space. Uh, I just want to point out, uh, so he's got sunglasses, he's got a beard, he has a hoodie, and he was born in 1991, same year as the web, which means that he's 100% millennial. That'll be important later. <laughs> Um, so, so we were out in the desert. Uh, I don't know how well you can see that, but, um, but we were taking some night, nighttime photography, some, star, uh, some astrophotography, and just chatting about things and you know, talking about work and how life went and everything. So the next morning, we emerged from the desert a little bit, and we were having tea, with, as you do in Jordan, um, a lot. Uh, it's highly recommended. Um, so we were having tea with his buddy that runs the, the tour company uh, with him. And, uh, and so Salim said, hey, can you help Salim, with, which is also this guy's name, also born in 1991. Uh, can you help Salim with his, with his computer, like with his phone? Uh, he needs an email address. And I'm like, okay, cool. I'm doing tech support for a family in the desert. <laughs> um, so, so he he proceeds to, you know, I figure like, okay, he's, he doesn't have an email address. Turns out he did have an email address, he just forgot the password to it. Uh, so he needed a new, a new email address. Um, but I was like, the first thing I said was like, you have an email address, we have emailed, that's how we set this up. And he was like, no, no, the white lady in town runs, runs my email, uh, my work email, I want my own email address. I was like, okay, we can, we can sort that out. So we debated a little bit and said, we'll, we'll set him up with a Gmail address. So he pulls out not one, but two phones, flagship phones, an iPhone 7 Plus and a Galaxy 7 Edge. Uh, uh, and like, he kind of lives in that truck, um, <laughs> or from that truck. Uh, but he's got these two flagship phones, um, and, and he doesn't have an email address. So that was, that was sort of an interesting uh, starting point for me. Um, and, his iPhone didn't have a SIM, so he had already configured tethering to get internet on his iPhone from his Android. So he's not, he's, he's not illiterate. Um, but, so we get, we get him set up with a, with a Gmail account. Um, and that went fairly smoothly, it was, it was all good. Um, and then, send a test email, he receives the test email, everything's going fine. I'm like, okay, great, you have an email address takes his phone, and he's like, it's not working. Like, what, what do you mean? I just sent you a test email. It's, it's definitely working. Okay, so I send him another test email. He receives it, he gets the test email, everything's fine. I'm like, okay, well let me see your phone. If it's still not working, like clearly there's something that I'm not getting. So it's asking for his email address and his password. And he doesn't understand the difference between his iTunes App Store account and his Gmail account because he shouldn't have to. Like, <laughs> that's, it, you know, the, the idea that you should 
that, that you should understand when someone asks for your email address and your password, that those might be hundreds of different things is something that we've internalized, but it doesn't make any sense. So, you know, we have totally failed as an industry. <laughs> this, is, this is an epic level of failure. So, right, let's recap. So we have Salim. He's a millennial <laughs> with not one, but two feature phones, and he can't set up his iTunes App Store account after setting up tethering. So shades of earlier talks going on here, I think. Um, but it gets worse. Um, <laughs> so we go to, so I'm like, okay, well, we need to set you up an iTunes account. Um, and I have literally pages of notes on how bad this process was. And this is Apple. They have trillions of billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars, and it's terrible. Um, but as Remy was just saying, uh, one of the things that they do really badly is this. So to have an Apple account password, uh, you have to have a password that must be at least eight characters long, including a number and an uppercase letter and a lowercase letter. Don't use spaces. The same character three times in a row, your Apple ID or a password you've used in the last year. Right. <laughs> okay, so that's going to be really easy to sort out because this guy doesn't remember the email, the password to his previous email address. So, um, so first step, he, he, he needs a number in his email address. So I was like, okay, we can sort that out. If you like it, you should have put a one on it. <laughs> so, Beyonce would be in trouble because you literally can't put a ring on it. <laughs> um, and, and like, we spend all of this effort trying to tell people that they need to have secure passwords with complicated forms, all this kind of stuff, and we don't support Unicode uh, emojis in, in the passwords. And like, part of the notes that I have on going through the, the sign-up process with Silly Miss, the, the Apple, the Apple sign-up form, was entirely not localized. So it was in English, he couldn't read it, I didn't speak Arabic, he was a smart guy, so we could, like, we, we figured it out. But, um, but it was really, really hard. He's living in the desert, so just look down, so payment method, none. Billing address, right, because <laughs> he needs a billing address. His address is Wadi Rum, Wadi Rum, Wadi Rum, Wadi Rum. <laughs> Which worked, thankfully. <laughs> um, and don't even get me started on John Appleseed. Like, oh my God, that is, like, they, not only did they not localize it, they made it as stereotypically American as they possibly could. So, taking a step back a little bit, what did Apple actually need? What they needed was a way for, to identify someone who was downloading an app from the App Store in a repeatable way. That's it. That's all they needed because they weren't taking payment information. He was only downloading free apps. Um, and they're just trying to prevent abuse or you know, other things. So they've like, literally took us five or six minutes to set this up um, start to finish. And it was like this really, really frustrating process. Um, and he now has to remember that he capitalizes the first letter of his password and sticks one on the end of it uh, from now on. So, so they really, they really mucked this up. Um, and unfortunately, it's not just Apple. It's like literally everyone on the web. So we have a lot to answer for. Um, so I'm just gonna sort of walk through what, because I think we've internalized this, we don't think about it anymore. Um, but I think it's important for us to, to sort of come to terms with like the basics. Um, so obviously we can't use Face ID or fingerprint to auth. Uh, on the web, don't try, please don't try. Um, <laughs> that would be bad. Uh, so, so this is, we've done this a thousand times, but when someone new comes to, to, the, to a website, this is their experience. So, sign up now, great. 
well, I'll punch in my email address and my password. And, oh, right, I signed up to this website before. Didn't remember. Okay, so we still have the sign up button because we might want to use a different email address, I guess. So we're gonna click the little link in the corner um, that's always tiny and hidden uh, and click sign in. So now we're gonna sign in uh, and it's asking for the same thing it just asked us for. So type in the same thing we just typed in and it says the incorrect password because, well, we didn't use that password when we signed up. I don't know, which password did we use? Well, maybe it was that one. No, wasn't that one. Maybe it was that one. No, wasn't that one. At this point, we're hoping that no one has this code running in production where they're logging plain text passwords before they decrypt it um, because we've just fished ourselves and all of our passwords that we use which people do every single day, all the time, all across the web. Um, so we, we do the, the tried and true method of resetting our password. So we type in our email address. Hit send. We go to our email account. Uh, we see our, our password reset uh, uh, email. Um, this is all assuming a fairly high degree of like internet literacy. Remember, like most people would have just totally failed a long time ago. So we get this, this message and we, we click the link, we follow it back to the site that we were originally on, and now we get to reset our password. Great, I love that part. So, <laughs> uh, so we choose an acceptable password and we hit reset password, and then they ask us to sign in because they apparently don't know who we are. So. <laughs> So we type in our email address and our password again for like the sixth time. And yay, we get to use the site. It's amazing. Um, so that, that took five minutes. And like there are, I have these conversations probably too often, there are a lot of people who only use email, like password reset links to sign into things because they just can't figure out any other way. So let's, let's take an abstract look at what actually happened in that process. So the user comes to the website and they say, I don't know my password. And the website says, I can't let you in. And that's good. You know, it's good that we don't give access to people who aren't us to our private data. So that's good, we, we got that part. Now, the next part is, okay, so here's my email address. We're gonna reset our password. And the website sends, um, uh, sends the code to our email. And then we go to check our email. Uh, and then we get the super secret code from our email. And then we send it to the, to the website. So the website then says, great, great to see you. I know who you are. Now, the only thing that we've done in this entire process is verified that the user has access to their email account. So all of that password stuff is irrelevant because if you set a password that you can change by having access to the email account, it's pointless to have the password in the first place if like 60% of your users are gonna go and reset their password anyways. It's just annoying. And I think we need to have a conversation about why we do this. So uh, <laughs> um, I think crypt the crypto culture, security culture has a problem. Um, it's framed security as hard. Uh, you know, cryptography is hard. Uh, but the people who hold the reins to, to what counts as good security or not uh, have, have sort of established a cultural niche um, that says that unless you are a crypto wizard, you can't do this. And the way that they determine success is by being good at cryptography. So the way that security is good is by being good cryptography. Um, that has very little to do with users. So, by the way, this image is literally the first Google result, Google image result for cryptographer. <laughs> so so I'm, not, I'm not just making this up. Um, uh, you know, people who are into cryptography are really into cryptography. I don't, I don't blame them. Cryptography is kind of cool. Um, it's, it's pretty remarkable what we can do with 
cryptographic technology. Um, and it, I, I believe that it does have an immense impact on our society, uh, and I think that it will continue to have an immense impact on our society. Um, but I think a lot of cryptographers think that crypto by itself will have that impact, and that's just wrong. Like, I think, I think we determine how crypto, and we need to determine how crypto interacts with our societies. Um, and that's hard to do sometimes, because um, I'm gonna go live now to uh, security on the internet. And it's important to note that there are like literally infinite numbers of people in orange shirts going for your stuff. Don't worry, you can do it, you can stay up there. Do it. See, look at all those people with their crypto. Keeping those guys away. Oh, no, that didn't work. Um, it turns out crypto can't keep all of the hordes at bay. <sighs> Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, this was really cool. Um, so this is, this is a blog post by Moxie Marlon Spike, who is really awesome, does all sorts of amazing work, um, about some stuff that Signal, which is a super cool encrypted end-to-end messenger, um, end-to-end end -to -end encrypted messenger uh, that provides the basis for the technology that drives the WhatsApp end-to-end encryption. Um, and he's talking about uh, basically doing contact, like anonymous contact discovery by using the secure enclave part that's in modern processors, but doing it in the server, not in your phone, so that he can't access your contacts, which is crazy and insane, and this blog post is amazing. To, to read the, 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 the immense stuff that they do. But I don't think it's that practical for most things. I think it's a lot like haute couture. You know, it's pretty cool. It's really, it's really, really interesting. I didn't know anything about fashion. I still don't, but I work basically at Vogue these days. And <laughs> um, this world is super, super interesting. But like most people want Levi's or H&M. Um, <laughs> Like, it just, it's, it's kind of irrelevant. Um, and so, there's a really interesting series of books called Object Lessons that, uh, um, that are just about everyday things um, as objects. Uh, and this guy, Paul Martin Eve, wrote a book called Password. So talking about passwords as an object. So of course I've read it. Um, and, and he says, uh, and I think this is a really important insight, the reason that the term identity theft is favored over any other of the alternatives is that it absolves institutions in the digital world of their responsibility for, in, in, for the inherent flaws in their authentication systems. So when we look at Equifax, Equifax says, oh, that's identity theft because someone came and stole it, not like, oh, we just left it out there. I don't know. What do you expect? It's like, because that would be fraud or somehow they would be responsible, but they, they externalize that and blame people. So, so we've essentially created this culture of like blaming the victims of security flaws. Um, and I think that's, that's, a, that's a real problem. So part of what that, what that means is that we end up with solution, like solutionism like this, where, where you get up, you, you end up with really, really poor approaches to security. Like, security questions are pointless. Never ask them. <laughs> United sign-in is almost this bad. <laughs> I really like the next one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's definitely secure because it's unique. Perfect, right? <laughs> but don't get it wrong, because then you would have, like, you're, you're to blame, because you haven't taken your security seriously. You should have used, like, a password manager or something. Apple's uh, approach here, you know, they would make a lot more money 
if they did this, because then people could sign into their stuff and spend money. It would be amazing. Um, <laughs> I asked a question a few months ago. Um, my, my followers on Twitter are highly biased towards security professionals, um, and only 30% lied and said that they never reuse passwords. <laughs> um, but like 70% of other people, like, oh yeah, I totally reuse passwords. I totally reuse passwords all the time. Um, password managers suck. I mean, they're good. We live in a broken world, and they, they sort of help us deal with that broken world, but they really suck. Um, you know, they don't, they don't work because they don't, like, if you change your password, oftentimes they'll just lose the changed password or create a new account. Now you've got six passwords, and you're like, I don't know which one, so I'll just use the email reminder link. Um, and if you manage to get a layperson successfully using a password manager, uh, what you're going to end up with is someone with a, with a database of all of their most secure, most valuable things on their computer, and then their computer is going to die, and they're not going to have access to any of it. And then they're just going to reset it by email anyways. So, um, you know, 2FA. 2FA is great. It's like for, your, for, for primary email, it's really, really good. Um, Danny O'Brien is the international director for the EFF. So he's like, God damn, I can't use this stuff. <laughs> he's been doing online internet security for like 30 years. Um, and, and he can't figure it out. How is anyone who's not in this room going to figure it out? So that's been a lot of like, ah, rent, negative stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, I think, um, I think there's a lot that we can do, though. Um, so I think there are a lot of really amazing people. Uh, Chelsea is one of them. Uh, there's a woman, Sarah Gold, uh, up in London, who's doing really amazing work. Uh, and there are too many others to list. But we need to think differently about how we address online security. Uh, and if we get this wrong, if we stop caring, it's not, in, in Chelsea's case, it's not just people's ability to communicate, but it's actually people's lives are at stake. So we need to figure this stuff out. We need to make it better for everyone. And I think, I think we got this. So security is hard. Passwords suck. All of our tools are terrible. What, what do we do? So this is, I'm just going to go through a few things that I think that, that I mean, I hope it, uh, in this room, if you're actually, hands up, who manages a website that has a sign-in form. So quite a few. That's good. That's good. So I hope, I hope some of you take this uh, and, and, and do some stuff with it. Uh, so first of all, don't require an account. If you don't need the account, don't require it. Um, so the place that Jen works does really, really well. So this was the first. This was an incognito window. That was the first time I've ever been to Glitch. And I just signed in, signed in, and now I'm using the product. And there, I'm done using the product. It's like 24 seconds. Um, the conversion rate on that is amazing. So if you don't need this, the sign-in, don't use it. If you don't need the sign-in right away, if you don't need a user account to interact with the user when they first land on their site, just wait, because they're going to reset their password by email anyways. <laughs> so, so just let them, you know, let them use the site. And if they've entered someone else's email address, like, I think that's probably OK, because that's not going to actually help them. Um, the other thing is databases are magic. You can look up users in all sorts of different ways. Um, so you know, when, when, we're, when we go through that, like, what's my username on this site? I wish there was a way I could find out what my username on this site is. And we go and we type in the email address, and then it sends us a link to the username. You could just tell them. Um, it would be fine. Uh, use long-lived sessions. So don't get people to enter their password all the time. This is one of the ones that, that security people get wrong a lot, um, because 
if someone is entering their password a lot, if they're used to entering their password a lot, then they get phished. And that's, that's especially for people that are at risk, um, uh, like Podesta, um, you know, if they're used to entering their password, there, there are going to be consequences for those sorts of things. Um, so, and I don't mean this kind of session. Uh, I mean that kind. Um, <laughs> right. Um, so, I think the other thing, and this one, this one I've worked a, a lot on, as I mentioned, I, I started the OAuth project many years ago, um, which was, I think, on the balance, good, bad, I don't know. Um, I have a lot to answer for. Um, but, uh, but, you know, use delegated authentication because it works. So I'm just going to explain, because I think it's really confusing for a lot of people how delegated authentication works um, and what it means. Uh, but really, all we're doing is verifying an email address. So here's, here's our diagram from earlier. Um, do you remember? We get the secret code, we pass it through email, and we send it back to the website. So it's basically just confirming that the person has access to their email, to their email address. Now here is delegated authentication. So it's exactly the same thing. The only difference is uh, the website is now talking to an authentication provider, um, and the authentication provider gives the website a secret code rather than the website giving the secret code to the authentication provider. And uh, the user asks the authentication provider, what's the secret code using redirect rather than, uh, rather than going and checking their email um, and potentially having to sign in to their email and potentially getting phished. Uh, so other than that, like, I'm glossing over a lot of technical details, obviously, but there are libraries for that. Um, it's the same thing. You can think about it the same way. So I think we, we, we have built a lot of um, user experiences that, that I think put people off of doing this. So often you'll, you'll see something that looks exactly like this. So we've got, you know, from, from the interface complexity perspective, we have sign in with Facebook, sign in with Google. We can use email or username or a password. We can stay signed in or not. We can sign in. And then if we've forgotten our password, username or email, or if we want to reopen our account, all of the options are open to us. Um, I mean, it must be really exciting to, to feel like you've got so many options. Um, but it's really confusing, and it's really terrible for, 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 the, for our users and for us. Um, so if we simplify this, we can do this, right? You say, sign in. I'm going to ask for your email, so ask for the email. And then you've got a button. And when they type in a Gmail address, you say, hey, I see you have a Gmail address. Would you like to sign in with Google? Because that's what you're going to do anyways. They click sign in with Google. And this, is the, I mean, this case is the one where, where they've signed up before. There's a, the, the, in, the initial sign up step has one extra step that I'm glossing over here. Um, so if they've ever visited the site before, they hit that sign in with Google button, and the next thing they see is the signed in site. So it's like literally one step. Um, we, at, I had a startup a couple of years ago, and we built this, and it worked really, really well. Um, so I'll get to some numbers in a little, in a little bit, but um, I just wanted to say you can build this. It does work. Um, and so that people don't get upset with me uh, for telling everyone, like, ah, don't worry about password managers, don't worry about 2FA, all that kind of stuff. Secure your primary email, because if someone gets into your primary email, all of the stuff that I've been saying means that they get access to literally everything. Um, so I think that's, that's a really important thing uh, to keep in mind. But one of, the, one of my hopes is that we'll get to a point where we talk about security and where, where literally us have approaches uh, to, to web security that means that we can teach users a very, very narrow bit of like how to be secure doesn't mean like become a cryptographer. It just means like secure your email. And I think we can actually teach that. So, um, you know, if there's, if there's one thing that you take from the talk, um, it's, it's that authentication on the web uh, in 2017 means securing your email. 
or means means just verifying your email, uh, and and that means securing your email. Uh, the second thing, like if you can, there's two things that you get. It's that we can take advantage of this. Um, we can use this to make everything better for people. Now, one of the things that that comes up a lot, um, certainly comes up for me, uh, when when talking about security stuff, is like, wh what about the money, right? You've got a functioning sign-in form, you, it works, people are signing in, they're using the site, why do you need to change it? Um, and uh, I just want a couple of examples. So I mentioned my startup, we looked, because we were doing experiments with the sign-in stuff, we looked at, at sort of the performance, our, our conversion performance, um, and there was a little bit of a panic when, uh, when the initial numbers came in uh, one of my co-founders came, came and said, like, we're losing 63% of first-time visitors to the site. They're not getting through to full signed-in, like, signed-in, signed-up users. I'm like, I think you just said that we have a 37% conversion rate on, like, brand new visitors. So <laughs> if your numbers aren't that, you can, you can definitely get there. Um, and Jared Spool, who's been talking about some of this stuff for a long, long time, uh, talks about this $300 million button. So by reducing barriers to getting access to a large online retailer that sells everything on the planet, um, <laughs> uh, they, were, they were able to, just, just on the conversion rate change alone, basically generate $300 million more a year revenue. So that's, that's, that's something. Um, and then I've, I found this, uh, from Heap Analytics, and the top, uh, the top one there is if you have third-party sign-in, it's by far the best way to improve your conversion. Um, and if you need, like, if you start asking for extra stuff, you just decrease your conversion rate. So, in the same way that, um, you know, the the Chrome team will talk about not asking for permission to location services before you have a reason to do so, I think we need to apply that to sign up as well. Um, and yeah, so hopefully you can take those to your boss and say, or if you are the boss, you can get more money. Um, <laughs> uh, right, so passwords are really boring. I'm so bored of talking about passwords, um, but I think they're really, really important. Uh, you know, I think I agree completely with Bruce the web isn't just ours, um, it's everyone's. And even if 1991 feels like ages ago, um, the, the internet is still very, very new. Uh, and we're just beginning to, to develop the tools that give people agency and autonomy on the web um, and on the internet. So we have some of those tools, uh, but there's a lot that are yet to be invented. Um, and there's, there's a, a lot that I didn't cover today. Uh, you know. One of the things that I hope some of you are thinking about uh, in that Gmail example is that if we move to everyone signing in with Gmail, they're only going to have more of a stranglehold on what it means to be online. Um, and the same thing is true of Facebook and a number of other companies. Um, but we need to figure out ways to address them, uh, address that. And right now, they do have a stranglehold, but we need to figure out ways that we can give people more more agency and make it easier for them to engage online. Um, and we're not gonna get there by victim blaming our users um, and by shame, like crypto shaming people. Um, we need to get there together. We need to get there one step at a time. So I hope you go and implement some of these things. Um, and I hope it was interesting, even though it was about passwords. <laughs> Thank you so much.